care for everyone. So now we are uh, on YouTube live from now on, what's 1300 hours. Okay. Shall we start then? So I think so. Others can join in. So. Okay. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Good afternoon and Assalamu Alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you all to this third webinar of Center for Aerospace and Security Studies. We have with us uh, Ambassador Zimir Akram, who is our principal keynote speaker. And he'll be joined by Dr. Adil from CAS and uh, Ms. Sitara Noor, who is our senior research associate, also to speak on the subject. Uh, I assure the attendees that uh, we have an interesting discussion in store for us because uh, these speakers have been dealing with the subject for uh, many, many years. The webinar was meant to be timed with Yom Takbir. However, due to unavoidable circumstances and due to Eid holidays, uh, it had to be postponed to today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Pakistan's nuclear capability demonstration in May 1998 was a very consequential event in the perennial arms race unleashed in the region by India since partition. In a very difficult economic situation, Pakistan has barely been able to keep its head above water to maintain the credibility of its conventional and nuclear deterrence. Failing to do this would have allowed India to run amok and do some silly things to disrupt the peace in the region. It is an oft-repeated cliche that nuclear weapons are for deterrence only and are not meant for war fighting. So when Pakistan became a nuclear armed state, it thought that it had managed to secure itself. But the history since then has proven otherwise. Since 1998, India has been itching for a fight and to prove that there is room for conventional conflict under the nuclear overhang. Pakistan keeps wondering why. Is it arrogance or hubris? The widening gap between the economic power of two neighbors has led India to be more aggressive. The Indian madness has been aggravated under the Hindutva driven Modi government. They annexed Kashmir by abrogating Article 370 and 35A to cause misery to Kashmiri Muslims in IOK, and then went on to disenfranchise Muslims all over India, passing the Citizen Amendment Act and instituting the National Register for citizens, of Citizens. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, our Qaeda was prescient when he said that at the, time, at the time of the partition, that those Muslims who stay back in India would continually have to prove their loyalty to India. Today, we see Muslims being lynched, denied sharing hospital wards with Hindus, property is not being made available to them on rent and boycotting of Muslim retail businesses. Even worse, they are being accused of spreading coronavirus at Pakistan's behest. Hindu vigilantism against Muslim has state backing. Their properties are set on fire while the police look on as an interested spectator. So what is evident is that Hindu hostility has been unending and that's the environment in which Pakistan is and has been in trying to seek security and peace. Our panelists will today trace this journey and analyze what it portends for the future. So I will hand over the mic to Dr. Adil Sultan. Thank you. So thank you very much for these opening remarks. I'm uh, Adil Sultan, one of the directors at Center for Aerospace and Security Studies, looking after uh, analyzing nuclear and strategic affairs. So on behalf of my colleagues at CAS, once again, welcome and good afternoon to everyone on a webinar that is titled Nuclear South Asia Challenges and Opportunities. So as the president also highlighted, the objective of this webinar was to uh, review the developments, both in the military and the civilian or the peaceful uses of nuclear technology over the last 22 years. 
to just to contextualize this debate uh, where we will be what we will be discussing in the next 45 minutes all three panelists uh, let me uh, read my opening statement and list the questions that we have uh, requested ambassador zamira kam uh, mr taran noor to address, uh, address those questions so it has been more than two decades since india and pakistan formally declared themselves as nuclear weapon states both countries are improving their nuclear capabilities with india trying to emerge as a global power while pakistan continues to focus on deterring both conventional as well as nuclear aggression from its larger eastern neighbor <clears throat> over the past two decades nuclear weapons have played an important role in maintaining strategic stability in in south asia and would continue to shape the scope and intensity of the future crises as well Besides the military-related developments, both India and Pakistan are also expanding their civilian nuclear program to meet their respective socio-economic needs. While India has been given an exceptional treatment by granting waiver from the Nuclear Suppliers Group, a nuclear cartel that regulates civil civilian nuclear trade, and that was uh, that came into being after India's nuclear test of 1974, which was a result of diversion of. civilian technology for peaceful uh, uh, for military purposes so this nsg has granted exemption to india and now india is eligible to enter into nuclear related trade with all the nsg countries while pakistan continues to face discrimination to discuss the role of nuclear technology in the military domain as well as its peaceful applications we have like um, uh, president also introduced ambassador samir akram Uh, and mr tara noor and myself i'll also briefly talk about pakistan's nuclear program and the developments uh, what role it has played over the last 22 years what we intend to to do is that we will speak for about 12 to 15 minutes each and then we will open the uh, forum for question answer session so you can see there is a window of question and answer i'll request all the participants guest participants to write their questions uh, in that window and in the end we will try and take as many questions as possible just an administrative announcement that in case of any technical glitch or fault uh, if you go offline you will immediately receive new password and uh, id and we should be able to resume our proceedings within 5 to 10 minutes so we'll, we will start with our first panelist ambassador zamir akram who is currently advisor spd Ambassador Akram served for 37 years in foreign service and retired in 2015. His foreign postings included Moscow, New Delhi, Washington, and UN in Geneva, including the Conference on Disarmament. Uh, at the headquarters in Islamabad, he has dealt with Afghanistan, South Asia, and the United Nations. So, we have requested Ambassador Akram to focus on the following three questions. But, sir, you are free to add on whatever you feel appropriate. The primary questions are: How has the nuclearization helped bring stability or instability in South Asia? Number two: Are there any lessons from the Cold War nuclear competition between the two former superpowers that could be relevant for South Asia? And third: What are the prospects of arms control and confidence-building measures between global powers, and what impact it can have for South Asia? Sir, over to you. thank you very much adil it's a pleasure for me to join all of you in this webinar uh, this morning uh, so let me start uh, right away <clears throat> from my perspective the perennial problem for pakistan from the very inception from its independence has been to ensure its security against a much larger much more powerful neighbor which has also with which it also has uh, some significant disputes such as kashmir and more importantly a country that has pursued a the goal of regional hegemony uh, which has placed pakistan's security in jeopardy from time to time and so for pakistan the security imperative is the most important consideration Uh, from its foreign policy and its security policy perspective prior to the acquisition of a non nuclear non weaponized deterrence or a virtual deterrence in about mid or late 1980s 
when uh, Pakistan's nuclear program had reached that point, uh, a situation of, as I said, non-weaponized deterrence came into being, preventing the outbreak of conflicts which had earlier taken place at the conventional level between India and Pakistan, such as the brass tax, such as the situation arising from the brass tax Indian military exercises, and in 1990 from the Kashmiri uprising. Uh, this indicated that even a virtual non-weaponized deterrence had brought about a relative situation of strategic stability. After the 1998 tests, this became a overt or weaponized deterrence based on mutual assured destruction. And most importantly, from Pakistan's perspective, uh, the acquisition of nuclear weapons capabilities neutralized the Indian superiority, numerical superiority that had existed in conventional weapons. And so a period, in my view, of relative strategic stability ensued, which led to confidence building measures, a dialogue on security issues, on nuclear issues between India and Pakistan, leading to the Lahore Declaration and some other subsequent agreements as well on confidence building. Uh, however, the Indians were uncomfortable with this environment, with the situation, and were keen to reassert the salience of their conventional capabilities, which led them to enunciate doctrines such as Cold Start, which sought the space to fight a conventional war uh, below the threshold of nuclear weapons. And then that led Pakistan to respond by evolving its own technological capabilities, in particular developing low yield nuclear weapons and short range delivery systems like the Nasser missile as part of its doctrine of full spectrum deterrence. According to this doctrine, we intend to or we plan to prevent the outbreak of war at the operational, tactical, or strategic levels. However, I want to underline the fact that there is a misconception, even in, within Pakistan, that full spectrum deterrence is meant to prevent even the outbreak of skirmishes along the LOC or on the international border. It is not. We as a responsible nuclear weapons state have to weigh the conditions in which full spectrum deterrence will be triggered. And I think uh, our strategic community and strategic leaders have already outlined the conditions under which uh, nuclear weapons use can be considered. And those conditions expressly state that there, if there is a threat to Pakistan's security and sovereignty, then we would contemplate using the use of nuclear weapons. We have also said that it will not be an automatic use, but it would be a graduated use depending on the security environment. And so a lot of uh, Indians particularly have been arguing, for instance, that when they carried out their so-called surgical strike in 2016, or when they carried out the attack on Balakot in uh, February last year, that this had exposed Pakistan's full spectrum deterrence because Pakistan did not use nuclear weapons. Uh, this, is a, this is wrong thinking, and I think the Indians really believe in this rhetoric of theirs. They are sadly mistaken because clearly, at no point during these crises uh, did the Indians actually begin, even begin to employ their cold start doctrine. And in the absence of a cold start type of attack, which would have involved a conventional, full scale conventional uh, attack on Pakistan, the question of invoking full spectrum deterrence did not arise. So that, I think, is a mistaken assessment 
of full spectrum returns and that needs to be clarified. Now coming to the present situation, I think the Indians are once again uh, trying to build up the capabilities, both strategic and conventional, uh, to bring back the salience of their conventional weapons. This time by an overwhelming nuclear or strategic capability that would even overwhelm, in their view, Pakistan's resort to full spectrum deterrence if a, a situation arose to that uh, at that point. They are doing so, I think, by developing ballistic missile defense systems by developing the entire range of ballistic missiles, short, medium, and long range, uh, submarine launch ballistic missiles, nuclear part submarines uh, armed with uh, nuclear weapons. <clears throat> they carried out a deterrence patrol, if you remember, <clears throat> apparently with, with live weapons, uh, carrying out an anti-satellite test, and also working on a new generation of missile systems such as MERV missiles and the BrahMos cruise missiles, which are supersonic and apparently also working on hypersonic uh, missiles as well. So these are, I think, strategic developments of the future. Uh, and we need to respond to those. I'm not, uh, I'm not one that uh, would argue for an arms race. We do not wish and do not want to engage in such an arms race, but certainly we need to develop the capabilities to respond to the qualitative changes uh, that can come about or are coming about as a result of the Indian uh, technology, uh, technological developments. Uh, incidentally, these developments are also helped in a very big way uh, by some of their allies, in particular by the United States, uh, which is trying to use India as a counterweight to China. And then <clears throat> in the present circumstances, as, uh, as also in, uh, in earlier situations that we have seen with Pakistan, now with China, India has become, has been encouraged to act more and more aggressively and more and more belligerently and irresponsibly such as the attack on Balakot, now the confrontation in uh, Ladakh with China. This, I think, has been encouraged by the kind of relations, the strategic partnership that the Indians have with the United States at present. Um, so what we need to do, I think, is basically to develop the ability to penetrate uh, Indian ballistic missile defense without necessarily building up and going through the wasteful expenditure of having ballistic missile defenses ourselves. Uh, this can be done by effective cruise missiles, MERV missiles, et cetera. We also need a sea-based deterrent, particularly for a credible second strike capability. And we also need to develop capabilities in space, particularly ASAT capabilities, because future wars will be fought in space since the communication command, communication uh, systems are entirely increasingly now going to be space-based through satellites, et cetera. So we need to respond uh, to these qualitative changes. Now, let me come to your second point, which is, uh, are there any lessons from the Cold War nuclear competition between the two superpowers relevant to South Asia? Now, in this context, I think, the most relevant uh, uh, lesson would be, of course, that we, Pakistan and India, need to engage. Uh, we, need to we need to be in dialogue uh, to, to ensure that we are aware, of, at least aware of each other's capabilities and that we are able to prevent any war by accident or an unintentional uh, act. Just as the United States and the Soviet Union did after the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, the other thing is that uh, we need to learn the negative lesson that engaging in an arms race, as the United States and the Soviet Union did, developing the capacity to blow each, each other up many thousand times, is not really relevant and not, necess not necessary for Pakistan or India, because we have the capability, 
we just need to make sure that the deterrence is credible. Uh, so this is the second lesson I would say. The third lesson is that we need to realize that we are in a geographically a much more dangerous confrontation or situation than the United States and the Soviet Union. Because given the distance between these two countries, it would take at least 30 minutes or more for any kind of nuclear attack to be registered or to, to have an impact in the, on the other side. In the case of India and Pakistan, the time lag is reduced to less than three minutes, number one. Number two, any nuclear use, uh, depending on which way the wind is blowing, is going to have an impact on either country. So no one is going to come out of this looking better or more powerful. Uh, this is going to be truly uh, what, was, what has been called the Samson option, which is committing mutual suicide. And so this is the third lesson that I think I would, uh, I would underscore uh, that, that, that India and Pakistan should take into account. But I must also add uh, that while the measures that we have taken are already in, are still in place, which is a good thing, such as the agreement not to attack each other's nuclear facilities, but in the present circumstances, with the current Indian government, the possibility of any kind of dialogue uh, does not seem to be realistic for Pakistan, although I think we are ready for such a dialogue. Coming to the, the third point, what are the prospects of arms control and CBMs between the global powers that could be relevant for South Asia? Now here, the first thought that comes to my mind <clears throat> is that even at the, at the, at the in the year, height of detente between the US and the Soviet Union and then subsequently Russia. This was a binary relationship in the sense that this was a dialogue between two almost more or less equal nuclear weapon states. Um, for us, the situation is somewhat different because it's for as at least whereas India, whereas Pakistan is concerned, our nuclear capability is focused exclusively on India. But the Indians claim that their nuclear capabilities, their strategic uh, capabilities are not Pakistan specific, but that they respond to a bigger threat and in that they include, uh, include China. And therefore it's from their perspective, this is a trilateral problem. Now, if you include the Chinese, it's a quadrilateral problem because the, the Chinese are say that they are not competing with India. They are really uh, ensuring the security against the Soviet Union, uh, against the United States. And we have had, uh, you know, at the, at the track two level, some kind of quadrilateral dialogue as well, which uh, didn't get very far. But uh, the fact remains that that is the complication. I recall that when I was in New Delhi, uh, in our I commission at that time in the in the mid 90s, Pakistan, keeping in view the Indian uh, perspective, had actually put forward a proposal for a five nation dialogue, which included Pakistan and India, plus the United States, China, and the Soviet Union stroke Russia. The US had supported such an uh, such a forum, and in fact had proposed a wider uh, group, which would have also included the other two uh, nuclear weapon states, France and Britain, plus Germany and Japan. However, uh, these proposals didn't get very far. Um, subsequently, I remember after the nuclear tests, and you know this other as well, that Pakistan um, proposed a uh, strategic restraint regime uh, in order to avoid an arms race and in order to prevent any kind of uh, breakdown of communications, etc. Uh, but except for the kind of CBMs that were worked out in the in the Lahore Declaration, uh, no other substantive uh, progress was made. And since then to now, uh, a lot of water has uh, flown down the Jhelum from Srinagar. And so uh, we are in a totally different kind of strategic environment as I, 
as I mentioned just before that. So, uh, and then also I think we should remember that arms control even between the United States and Russia today has fallen apart. Uh, in the Bush years, uh, the US uh, exited from the ABM treaty. Now, uh, Mr. Uh, Trump has left the INF treaty and is not ready to resume dialogue for, uh, for uh, a resumption of, for renewing the new START agreement. And there are even now in a few last few days talks about the US considering uh, conducting nuclear tests, uh, which would mean effectively the end of the comprehensive test ban treaty as well. Uh, so in this environment, uh, even the, the major powers uh, are moving in a direction that is not helpful. And if uh, these treaties break down, particularly if the CTBT breaks down, uh, that I know for, for sure, and I'm sure you have also read all this, the Indians are itching to conduct more nuclear tests. And uh, if the Indians test, I'm quite sure that our scientists would also be willing to conduct tests. So that would be the end of the CTBT. Uh, so this is uh, what I had to say. If I've left out anything, I'd be happy to answer that in the Q&A. Thank you. Sir, thank you very much. I think very comprehensive overview of uh, the nuclear environment in South Asia. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, most of things that I intended saying, as these have been addressed already. So <laughs> I'll, I'll try to avoid those duplications as much as possible. Uh, but there's always value to giving a different perspective or adding more points because uh, today's webinar is about to commemorate 22 years of nuclearization, what have we gained and where we are and where we are heading. So in my brief remarks, and thanks to Ambassador Zamir Akram, so I, I'll try and complete even less than 15 minutes because many things have been already said. I'll focus on three questions. Why India, Pakistan acquired nuclear weapons, role of nuclear weapons in Pakistan's security calculus, and the future trajectories. So coming to the first question, why India and Pakistan acquired nuclear weapons? This is a very basic concept or basic thing. Uh, and why it is important to understand is because uh, one, uh, the nuclear drivers, the motivations that led both India and Pakistan to build nuclear weapons are also reflected in the nuclear postures and doctrines. So if somebody is able to clearly understand the nuclear drivers, uh, they will be able to understand the future tra trajectory of nuclear doctrines or fosters also. Number two, as Ambassador Zamir Akram also stated about this myth of nuclear triad, I have always been uh, against this. It was never a triad. It has at best, uh, it can be said as two different diets between India, China, and India, Pakistan, once we talk about a nuclear process. So if you see, I don't want to go over the history, but it is important to understand because we continue to read and hear that India's main threat is from China, India's primary purpose to build the bomb was China. It was never the case. India started its nuclear program in 1950s. It was a dual track program, both military and civilian application. And by late 1950s, actually in 1958, the father of India's nuclear bomb, Homi J. Bhava, claimed that India can build a bomb probably in 18 months if the political leadership gives the direction. Whether it, India had the capacity or not, but it indicates the intent. And this was the time when India-China relations were very cordial. And in our local language, we, as we say, they used, there used to be a slogan, Hindi, Chini, Bhai Bhai. So China was never an existential threat, never a justification to start a nuclear program. Uh, it's a post-Cold War phenomena or a perception that has been created that China is a major threat for India and hence India needs to build its nuclear program. Uh, I'll just give two, three examples to support that. 1964 Chinese test, there was no major concern by India 
uh, to expedite its nuclear weapons program, although there was the intent or there was a dual track program ongoing in India. And again in 1974, once in, uh, India tested its uh, nuclear device, China was never cited a major consideration. And uh, to justify that nuclear test, Indian said it's a peaceful nuclear explosion. So if China was a major consideration or an existential threat from India from the very start, at least the 74 test should have been, uh, the justification for that peaceful nuclear explosion could have been China. In 1998, MPC, again, uh, there was official correspondence letter written to President Clinton uh, that because of the Chinese threat and probably Pakistan had also conducted a one solo missile test of Gori, they built a justification that regional security environment uh, mandated that India conducted a test. But in 95, 96, India tried to conduct tests. It was stopped by US because they picked up, the satellites picked up. So again, China or Pakistan was never a justification. India always wanted to acquire this capability because from the Indian perspective, it is a shortcut to a great power status. And hence we can say that India's nuclear program was always prestige driven and it continues to remain prestige driven. And in the future also, if once we see the trajectory, the Indian Ocean, the acquisition of second strike capability, <clears throat> aircraft carriers and other things, they're all prestige driven. The ICBMs even, they go beyond China. So if it, China is a major threat, at least the missile ranges should restrict to Chinese mainland, but it goes to other continent. So hence, major powers, all major powers, they have ICBMs and India want to acquire that. So that's the uh, brief history of India's nuclear program. On the other hand, if we see Pakistani side, Pakistan started its nuclear program very reluctantly and in 1975 in actual terms. Reason, we didn't have the resources, we didn't have the technological know-how, but after 71 war and 74 tests, Pakistan had no other option to build a nuclear uh, capability to restore that strategic balance that India was trying to uh, uh, destabilize. So, Pakistan's nuclear driver has always been security driven. It is uh, fo uh, focused on India's threat, a single threat, and that's how our nuclear developments have been. Whatever India does, Pakistan only uh, does as much to counter that threat which is emerging or the intent to destabilize the region. Pakistan only tries to restore that strategic balance. So uh, if you see in the doctrine or the nuclear posture that Pakistan continues to maintain, we are very clear this capability is against a particular threat emanating from the Eastern border. It is for Pakistan's national security. There's nothing about prestige or to achieve a global power ambition or uh, things like that. So it's important because I'm not going to details of the doctrines or postures, but anybody who reads that or who studies that, the students and other scholars who comment, they would understand that why Pakistan uh, reacts to whatever India does because we feel a certain existential threat from India and that's the purpose of our nuclear capability. Coming to the second question, that is role of nuclear weapons in Pakistan's uh, security calculus. I'll not go into all the uh, past crisis, Ambassador Akram has already uh, cited a few of those, but briefly, 86, 87, 1990, uh, these were the crises before Pakistan became over nuclear weapon state, but there is a, uh, now reasonable knowledge or literature available that Pakistan had acquired some capability to build a bomb even before 1998, but it didn't test. And in fact, Pakistan was continuously offering proposals to India to keep the region free of nuclear weapons. So that was the intent before 1998. Again, for the same purpose that Pakistan couldn't afford to get into this nuclear game. But once uh, India tested in 1998, Pakistan had no other option but to uh, uh, demonstrate its capability. So in terms of crisis, 86, 87 brass tax or 1990 Kashmir uprising, nuclear weapons didn't play any direct role, but the international community knew that both India and Pakistan have some potential, so there it attracted international players to come and defuse the crisis. So we can say that uh, nuclear deterrence played un uh, some some role or indirect role in defusing those crises. 99 was a different case. Both India and Pakistan had become 
overt nuclear weapon state, they are this, I'm talking about the Kargan. Uh, again, uh, during that time, Pakistan didn't have operational delivery systems. So in terms of some news reports or some Western reports, they cite that Pakistan probably uh, mobilized its missiles, uh, but we read in President Musharraf's memoirs also, Pakistan didn't have operational capability in terms of missiles. We had probably some air del delivery uh, capability at that time, but in terms of overall nuclear capability, if we say it was not fully operationalized. So nuclear weapons did play some role, again, attracting international power, but not direct role in defusing that crisis. 2001 and two was the main crisis, or we can see the first classic example of deterrence in South Asia, where India mobilized and the, the troops stayed there for almost eight months, but couldn't cross international border or the LOC because Pakistan demonstrated that uh, if India went beyond certain red lines, it might contemplate the use of nuclear weapons also. So we can say that deterrence did work, did prevent India, which is a relatively much bigger country, in, uh, uh, and prevented a war. Uh, 2008, there was no nuclear signaling from either side. Uh, India signaled that it can resort to surgical strikes and Pakistan also responded. The mo it mobilized its air force in a very, very quick time. The operational bases were uh, mobilized and uh, the message was given, okay, you can do a surgical strike, but in response, Pakistan would do the same thing. And within a few hours, the Pakistan air force, uh, the forward operational bases were active and uh, probably if India had conducted a surgical strike, Pakistan definitely would have responded the way it responded in 2019 Balakot crisis. So that's a very clear message that Pakistan has very clear red lines in the conventional field also. Uh, Balakot, Ambassador Zamir Akram has already said this about, um, there was a lot of chatter or narrative coming from the Indian side that Pakistan's nuclear bluff was torn. There was no nuclear angle to this crisis. But Indian commentators or the Western scholars, they misinterpret full spectrum deterrence as very rightly Ambassador Zamir Akram said. And they said, since Pakistan didn't uh, use or employ its uh, tactical nuclear weapon, hence its nuclear bluff has been called, which is totally incorrect because surgical strikes or um, uh, firing across the LOC, this, these are not events which would trigger in the nuclear response from the Pakistani side. And uh, we, from the Pakistani side, uh, whenever we talk about full spectrum deterrence, we also assert that there are conventional responses to even India's cold start doctrine also. So it doesn't mean that in a future crisis or whenever something happens, Pakistan would immediately resort to uh, nuclear weapons. But taking a cue from the Indian side, if they assume that Pakistan's nuclear bluff was called, uh, whereas it was not, one can also say that China has now called India's nuclear bluff. They detained Indian soldiers, more than 50 soldiers were detained. They captured Indian territory uh, in Ladakh, uh, across the LSE, uh, and India didn't do anything. And here we can see that India's response to Pakistan is in, was entirely different what it, it has, uh, the way it has responded to China. And that also supports the, uh, my primary thesis that China is not an existential threat. China and India are not going to go to a major war. They have more than $92 billion of bilateral trade. It is not in their interest. India know, also knows its limitations. Uh, it will not engage in a military conflict. But uh, there's an interesting aspect. Whenever there is a crisis with Pakistan, Indian political leadership, exploit, they exploit it for political, uh, domestic political dividends. And whenever there is a crisis with China, they use that crisis mainly for uh, international diplomacy to give signal to the international players, look, we are standing against China, help us build our military potential. So there are two diff different trajectories. Pakistan helps them in domestic politics and China helps them in international politics. Uh, I'll also briefly talk about economic side of uh, maintaining that nuclear deterrence. There was a recent report by International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. They gave certain figures about defense expenditures or the nuclear weapon spending and maintenance of all the nuclear weapon states. By no means I'm trying to endorse the numbers or whatever it is, but there are certain interesting conclusions that can uh, be drawn from that report. According to that report, 
Uh, Pakistan and India have almost similar kind of nuclear weapons. India is spending $2 billion annually for maintenance and development of its nuclear program, which again is an understatement because India has much more potential. And according to that report, Pakistan is spending around $1 billion annually to maintain its deterrence. So if you see the differential in terms of conventional spending, India is spending $71 billion and Pakistan is spending almost $10 billion in terms of conventional. But by spending or investing in this nuclear capability and spending $1 billion, we are getting much big, bigger offsets uh, by not competing in conventional arms race. So that's the importance of nuclear deterrence, that you spend less, maintain the credibility of integrity of your nuclear deterrence, and you get more dividends because India is almost seven times they have uh, uh, in terms of conventional spending. Pakistan cannot afford to get into uh, that arms race, and it should not. And there, that is, there is, uh, this is where uh, the nuclear capability helps Pakistan to at least uh, maintain or uh, restrict its conventional or the overall military expenditures and divert, divert its resources for socio-economic needs, which in the post-COVID environment are definitely going to be a priority for any government. Now, briefly talking about the future trajectory, because Ambassador Zameen Akram has already talked about second strike capability, capability in the ABM systems and things like that. I'll not uh, repeat those, but I'll briefly talk about the emerging thought in India's strategic enclave. Once I talk about strategic enclave, I talk about their civil and military bureaucracies and the political leadership. There are signals that India might review its no first use posture against Pakistan. That means no first use is that a nuclear state gives a commitment that it will not use nuclear weapons first against another state. But several senior leadership, uh, former defense minister, the current uh, defense minister, Rajnath Singh, the former commander of the strategic force command and national security advisor, Shev Shankar Menon, they have all indicated that there is a possibility that India might review its no first use posture and contemplate a, a preemptive first strike against Pakistan. Now, that's a very dangerous thinking in India's nuclear doctrine. Internationally, India continues to sell this argument that India is a responsible country and it maintains no first use posture. But uh, at the operational level or within India's nuclear command authority, because these all people are member of India's nuclear command authority, they are giving signaling. Uh, this could be or uh, possibly they don't believe themselves in India's new, no first use posture or probably there is a thinking ongoing within India's strategic elite to review this no first use posture. So if India does that, and there are uh, indicators also, because India is building hypersonic glide vehicles, uh, we know that it's, uh, for now, well, they say it, it will be conventionally armed, but it can be nuclear armed also. But India is also developing capabilities like ABM systems. So there could be a sense of false security amongst India's decision maker, and they might contemplate a preemptive first strike against Pakistan with this false assurance that whatever would be left, they would be able to intercept from uh, the Pakistan. I think that's a very dangerous thing. And uh, that's where we, we should understand. And one final point, while the international community continues to criticize uh, Pakistan or uh, the development of tactical nuclear weapons and alleges that Pakistan has probably moved to a nuclear war fighting uh, doctrine, which is completely false. Uh, um, uh, Ambassador Akram has already mentioned about full spectrum deterrence and we can discuss this in a uh, question answer session also. These tactical nuclear weapons or short range ballistic missiles that are part of Pakistan's full spectrum deterrence response were primarily aimed to prevent even a limited conflict, military conflict with India. So the primary purpose is to deter the entire spectrum of war. This, the purpose of this full spectrum is to entire spectrum of threats starting from tactical operation to strategic level. These are war prevention weapons. These are not for war fighting. But what India is building now in response to these tactical nuclear weapons is that they are building their own tactical nuclear weapons, Prahar and several others, which the international community has not taken into consideration. And the purpose of India's development of these tactical nuclear weapons is because their doctrine was being discredited uh, after Pakistan's introduction of this uh, full spectrum deterrence and tactical nuclear weapons. So there was a thought that India should have a proportionate response in case Pakistan contemplates the use of its tactical nuclear weapons. So what they are going towards is 
nuclear war fighting. So Pakistan introduced its short-range ballistic missiles prevent, uh, primarily to prevent a conflict. But on the other hand, India's tactical nuclear weapons are being geared to fight a limited nuclear war. So these are two different uh, uh, explanations or uh, understandings. Uh, but of course, uh, the, there is overwhelming focus on Pakistan's nuclear capability, which is mainly political because of the political reasons. Uh, so I'll stop here. Uh, since I was the moderator and no one could stop me, so my apologies, I over uh, shot by three, four minutes. So next, we have uh, Ms. Sitara Nu. Uh, she will educate us on Pakistan's achievement in the field of peaceful applications of nuclear technology and also cover briefly the measures taken for the safety and security of nuclear material, technology, and facilities. Ms. Noor is a senior research associate at CAS. Previously, she worked at Vienna Center for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation in Austria as a research fellow and at the Pakistan Nuclear Regulatory Authority as an international relations analyst. She was also a visiting fellow at the Stimson Center, Washington, DC, Sandia National Labs, and Monterey Institute for International Studies, US. Ms. Satara will focus on the following aspects, how nuclear power can help Pakistan meet its energy shortages? Why is it important for Pakistan to join the NSG, that is Nuclear Suppliers Group, and what are the prospects? Is Pakistan ready to engage in a CBM process with India? Ms. Stoot, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adil. Uh, I would actually shift attention from the previous discussion that has taken place at this forum. Uh, and as you rightly shared earlier, that uh, Pakistan nuclear program remains under international focus. Uh, and global scrutiny, as well as the global security, and as a default, its nuclear, civilian nuclear program had been underappreciated and uh, less recognized, which is otherwise very comprehensively developed and uh, adding to the national development. So my discussion will focus on three main areas. First, development of Pakistan's peaceful nuclear program, uh, looking at its uh, nuclear safety and security regime, that's very comprehensive and uh, globally appreciated. Uh, and followed by briefly talking about on NSG debate and CBM process with India. So looking at Pakistan's nuclear program and its development, uh, Pakistan was a direct beneficiary of the uh, Atom for Peace program of the United States in 1950s, unlike India, whose nuclear development predates its creation. Uh, it was in 1995 that, uh, it was in 1955 that the government of Pakistan established a 12 member uh, committee of scientists for promoting peaceful applications of nuclear science and technology. Pakistan Atomic Energy, uh, Atomic Energy Ordinance was promulgated in 1965 uh, on 27 May to be precise. And according to the ordinance, the function of the commission shall be to do all the acts and things, including research work necessary for the promotion of peaceful uses. So Pakistan's nuclear program primarily uh, was for peaceful application. Uh, with a long-standing professionalism in this area, Pakistan has developed strong a credential with respect to the IAEA safeguard implementation at its facilities, the presence of a robust regulatory mechanism, uh, and a commitment to pursuing uh, ex uh, and expanding its civilian nuclear program to not only to meet its energy need, but also which also adds to its uh, socioeconomic development. So talking about the areas Pakistan is using nuclear technology, uh, its applications are being used in diverse areas of electricity generation, health, agricultural, uh, hydrology, industry, environment, and basic sciences. Uh, nuclear program that started in 1965, as I stated earlier, was primarily focusing on not only the nuclear application in health and agriculture, but also generating energy. So currently, Pakistan has uh, five operational civilian nuclear power plants, which are generating about 1430 megawatt, which is 5.7 to total energy generation. Uh, goal is to expand 40,000 megawatt as envisaged in National Nuclear Energy Vision 2050. So, apart from the nuclear energy used for uh, use for uh, uh, development uh, development of nuclear energy, Pakistan is using nuclear application for the achievement of nine of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals uh, with the support of the IAEA. And uh, all these areas, civilian application are helping in Pakistan in nine of those uh, sustainable development goals, for instance, zero hunger, good health, clean water, affordable and clean energy and industry, climate action, and 
uh, few others. So PhD is pursuing research and development broadly in following area, which includes basic applied sciences, food, agricultural and uh, agriculture and biotechnology, human health, energy and industry. And uh, with regards to research and development, PAC has established a network of uh, institutions which are uh, imparting education uh, lead, led by Pakistan Institute of uh, Nuclear Science and Technology, uh, PINSTEC, which is the primary source of uh, Pakistan's uh, human resource in its nuclear program and nuclear development. And uh, in agriculture, as well as biology, agriculture in Karachi and Faisalabad and uh, Peshawar as well. In the health sector, there are a number of developments that uh, Pakistan has uh, taken up. Uh, Pakistan's uh, National Cancer Research Center, Cancer Registry and Program of Action for Cancer Therapy. These are some of the areas which are uh, exponentially helping uh, in, not only in cancer research, but also in treatment. And currently there are 18 medical centers focusing on cancer treatment, uh, which are established under the Pakistan, Nuclear, uh, Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission, and uh, two more are under constructions. And these hospitals serve nearly 1 million patients each year by using nuclear applications. And uh, moving forward to, uh, as I stated earlier, Pakistan's nuclear weapons program remained under focus. And broadly, Pakistan civilian as well as a nuclear weapon program had remained under scrutiny because of the perceived nuclear security risks. Uh, and the safety risk as well as the safety risk. So the second part of my discussion would focus on what those nuclear uh, security risks are as well as safety and uh, what action Pakistan has taken uh, with regards to address those threats or perceived threats. So broadly speaking, Pakistan's perceived nuclear security threats abroad had been internal instability and risk of state failure, uh, nuclear weapons or materials falling into wrong hands and loss of control or unauthorized use of nuclear weapons as well as there were a number of concerns internationally shared a number of concerns with regards to what Pakistan's nuclear safety applications are. So let's take a look at uh, the evolution of nuclear safety and security regime in Pakistan, which is strongly embedded in the legislative and institutional structure starting in 1964, uh, as Pakistan embarked upon its nuclear program, Pakistan Nuclear Safety Commission came into being. Uh, and Pakistan Safety and Radiation Protection Ordinance was passed in 1984, leading to Nuclear Regulatory Board in 1994, which finally culminated into the development of Pakistan uh, Nuclear Regulatory Authority in 2001. Uh, these, uh, they are not only looking at the safety aspect, but also the security aspect, and to help that, uh, or to further institutionalize that National Command Authority Act came into being in 2010. And to look at the export control area, Strategic Export Control Division was established in 2005, uh, 2004. Apart from these uh, uh, legislative institutional structure, there are national security system that have been established in Pakistan to deal with any uh, security or safety threat that might emerge. Uh, there is a security division under SPD that is primarily assigned the task of uh, securing Pakistan's nuclear assets, be it in the civilian domain as well as uh, or the uh, weapon side. There is a physical protection and security directorate working under PNRA, uh, which is specifically looking at various aspects of nuclear safety, uh, nuclear security in the civilian domain, uh, from securing uh, orphan radioactive sources to covering the border security to ensure that no nuclear material uh, comes into country without being detected, uh, as well as ensuring physical security of all nuclear assets across the country. Pakistan has also established Center of Excellence for Nuclear Security, uh, which comprises of a training academy at Chakri, National Institute for Nuclear Safety and Security at PNRA, and National Institute, uh, Pakistan Institute for Engineering and Applied Sciences. PSINs, uh, has an international stature and has conducted various IAU courses with participants over 45 countries on various aspects of nuclear safety and security. There are a number of additional systems that Pakistan has established with regards to uh, controlling or mitigating any nuclear emergency related situation. Uh, Pakistan is well prepared and uh, in close coordination with IAEA, there are a number of systems that have been established. And Pakistan is fulfilling uh, not only for its uh, domestic needs, not only to 
uh, serves its uh, national requirements, but also to international obligations. There are a number of international conventions that Pakistan is part of uh, in safety and security. There are UNSC resolutions and IAEA resolutions that Pakistan uh, definitely looks into uh, to comply with. In the third part, I would quickly talk about the NST debate briefly. I would just touch upon these areas briefly so that we have ample time uh, for discussion. And uh, I just throw certain ideas and that could be actually covered and uh, discussed during the question and answers. Uh, the NST is primarily uh, was created in response to India's nuclear test in 1974. The purpose of this organization at that time was to stop further proliferation by regulating uh, international nuclear trade. But what is, it has done is that uh, while it has, uh, uh, it's ironical rather that India got waiver without fulfilling any specific criteria enlisted in the NSG because of the uh, other political reasons. Uh, whereas Pakistan having almost meeting almost more and uh, equal or more criteria is unable to become part and which hinders its uh, civilian nuclear program exponentially. So that's Pakistan's approach had been in, at various international forum that NSG should establish a robust criteria based approach for non NPT states. And uh, if their standards are met, they should on certain criteria, they should be made part of the NSG so that it does not hinder the civilian uh, developments of any country, unlike uh, the political approaches that have been done to favor India's uh, participation in it. Uh, quickly touching upon some of the nuclear CBMs, as that, is, that was also part of the question that was being asked uh, initially. Uh, again, I would just briefly talk about some of the uh, CBM process that has taken place. Uh, but before that, I think it is important to understand that uh, CBMs or the nuclear CBMs, nuclear confidence building measures, are means towards an end and not end in itself. They are just a process to develop certain confidence over which some concrete agreements, some concrete understandings between the states, particularly in this case, India and Pakistan could have uh, developed. But unfortunately, uh, that means between India and Pakistan had remained just means and they did not lead to any concrete development or follow up discussions that would actually help resolve uh, the primary issues between the two states. So Pakistan, uh, like in uh, conventional side, Pakistan and India have had a number of nuclear CBMs, uh, which include uh, early notification of missile test and non-attack agreement. And uh, these are these two particularly are the CBMs that have withstood the pressure of time, withstood the pressure of uh, various crises that had taken place. And uh, both countries had almost religiously uh, uh, abided by these two CBMs. But the question arises that uh, while they are important, it is important, also equally important to build upon those uh, CBMs and uh, make them more updated. But unfortunately, there is no appetite on Indian side to actually enhance or expand those CBM, uh, that CBM process. Regardless that, uh, not considering the fact that Pakistan had put on table a list of nuclear safety and security related confidence building measures. And Pakistan had also uh, requested India to to develop uh, their unilateral moratorium of non-testing into a bilateral moratorium. But uh, that again had not met any reception on Indian side because probably uh, India is not willing to engage and as rightly highlighted by the previous speakers that uh, apparently with the, there is no expectation that there would be any positive engagement as long as the current regime or the current uh, line of action that India is taking right now is continuing. Uh, so what are the future prospects and uh, how Pakistan should actually look at cumulatively uh, to enhance not only its uh, international image as a peaceful, uh, as a responsible nuclear state that not only has weapons, but also has a very, very comprehensive and uh, unfortunately underappreciated nuclear, uh, civilian nuclear program. So first and foremost, foremost it is important that uh, we must promote and talk about uh, Pakistan's achievements in civilian domain. Uh, to get out of that negative spotlight. As I've stated and emphasized earlier that uh, while nuclear developments or the nuclear aspect remains under focus, there are a number of developments that Pakistan has achieved in the civilian side. Uh, and they are widely recognized uh, in the IAEA sector and the countries who are actually collaborating with Pakistan on that aspect. So that needs to be talked about more and promoted more. And uh, Pakistan should enhance supply capacity and indigenize commercial uh, and uh, indigenize and commercialize technology. Uh, 
uh, while it is important to focus and try keep attempting on becoming part of the NSG uh, through a criteria based approach, side by side Pakistan should work on indigenizing uh, their capability to increase their nuclear weapons, uh, sorry, the nuclear civilian nuclear aspects because uh, one way or the other, their hindrances would continue to come. Pakistan must solve funding issue because uh, we talk about having civilian nuclear energy deals with other countries, but uh, there is funding issue that always uh, hinders, I mean, there are political hindrances, but uh, if such an idea materializes, there would be funding issues. So we must continue on that. And uh, of course, discrimination against Pakistan by the Western powers, we must continue to work and uh, uh, project our capability in that domain so that those discriminations can be undercut. Uh, side by side, we must continue to work on self-sufficiency, as I emphasized earlier, and expanding cooperation with China, because that's where our most collaboration comes from and uh, happens. Uh, on the NSG front, we must continue its, uh, Pakistan continue its effort in gaining equitable and non-discriminatory access for the international civilian nuclear cooperation. And the uh, NSG debate is currently not on the forefront, but uh, at back end, I think there are diplomatic effort that must continue regardless of if it is in focus or not. Uh, on this, uh, there are some specific action that Pakistan take and uh, I'm happy to talk about them in more detail if there are some questions, which include upgradation of safety and security measures. Because uh, as I said, Pakistan enjoys a very good reputation in the safety and security measures that it has taken already. Uh, but I think it's uh, important we continue uh, to collaborate with the IAEA to uh, ensure that uh, that good reputation is continuously maintained. Uh, likewise, we should continue close cooperation and collaboration with the IAEA and not only remain limited to that area that we have traditionally been working because uh, IAEA's work is expanding exponentially in different areas. So we must be forward looking and uh, forward looking in our connection with the IAEA, establish better connection. Information sharing would actually remain very, very important because uh, if you look at uh, some of the negative spotlight that comes primarily because we at times shy away because of multiple concerns that we may have, the state may have at different times. But information sharing is very, very important uh, because we don't want much attention to be given to our nuclear weapons program. We shy away from sharing some of the information on the civilian side as well. Uh, for this purpose, I think it would be important to clearly delineate civilian setup from the military. While Pakistan has done a lot already in that regard and we claim that we have delineated civilian and military setups, but uh, in order to become more active on the civilian side, probably more effort needs to be done in that area. I thank you and I look forward to the questions. Adil, can I uh, add something? Uh, sir, uh, uh, in the same context or uh, there's something else? Yeah, because the number yes, of I questions. just want to, yeah. just in the same context, very small point, just to add to what has been presented in an excellent presentation by Ms. Noor. And that is about Pakistan's uh, cooperation with CERN, the yes. Center for the European, the European Center for Nuclear Research. You know, in 2015, Pakistan became the only non-European country, the first non-European country to become a member of CERN, an associate member of CERN. And before that, Pakistan had been in Pakistani nuclear scientists and technicians and engineers had been closely associated with various programs at CERN, including the setting up of the, uh, the big, the large hydron collider uh, that exists over there. Uh, and some of our nuclear scientists like Dr. Abdul Salam and so many others uh, have been honored by this uh, the institution. And uh, even today, uh, the Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission is a close partner of CERN in various programs in Geneva as well as in other parts of the world, like in Jordan on the Sesame program. So that is a fill up to our, the civilian side of our nuclear uh, capabilities, uh, which also needs to be given the right kind of projection. Sir, thank you very much. I think those were very useful comments uh, uh, to build on what Ms. Noor was saying. Uh, we have a number of questions and we have time uh, around 40 minutes or so. And what I'll do is I'll try to wrap those questions 
so so that we can answer as many as possible so a set of questions first uh, i think i'll request ambassador um, zamir akram to address this question by ambassador jalani uh, how do we propose to maintain strategic balance in the face of s400 missile defense systems acquired by india when s400 boasts of multiple layered defense protection against incoming missiles including cr uh, cruise and ballistic missiles as well as merv technology is there a credible study to show that merv can blunt s400 secondly do we have a mechanism to determine if a missile launched by adversary is a nuclear or a conventional missile before it hits the target so this is a question while you think about it i'll uh, uh, i'll allot one question to myself that's on full spectrum deterrence so but i'll address that question in the end uh, the second question that i want to uh, bring out for uh, president kas if he wants to this is a question by because this area relates directly to kas uh, interest uh, this is about by mr ali jabir malik who is from app he says the pakistan preparedness and response against india has always gave pakistan an edge over india due to its efficiency and proficiency in war domain the indian dominance in space war medium is creating a sort of strategic disbalance uh, will pakistan's least attention in, on its space program weaken its nuclear might before india so that's a question for uh, president kas if he wishes to address that on uh, ms sitara's uh, i think she uh, wrote a very interesting article today which appeared in uh, one of the leading newspaper on ongoing india china tensions so i know your expertise is not only peaceful application you have been working on deterrence all issues also so if you want to comment on those tensions from a nuclear angle i have said some things but if you want to add those and finally i'll talk about something about full spectrum deterrence ambassador akram sir okay so uh, my friend ambassador jilani has asked a, a difficult question and it's difficult because fortunately there is no uh, practical experience that exists uh, to answer this because no one has actually used anti ballistic missile systems no one has tried to penetrate them and uh, had they done so we would have had some kind of data on on, on whether or not uh, what would the outcome so what i'm going to say is based simply on conjecture on on uh, guesstimates and the first point about the s400 russian s400 uh, ballistic missile defense system that india has acquired from russia whether that would destabilize uh, yes i think the short answer is yes it would destabilize uh, because uh, at least in my view uh, ballistic missile defense systems or abm systems are inherently destabilizing because stability is based on the mutual perception of vulnerability that was the rationale of the argument originally made for the abm treaty between the united states and the soviet union that they both sides voluntarily accepted that they would remain vulnerable to each other and therefore the deterrence between them would remain credible uh, the americans then uh, have knocked out that argument by developing you know their ballistic missile capabilities and then the russians and so in in the indo pakistan context as well uh this should have remained a part of our strategic uh, equation and in fact if you look at the strategic restraint regime that we presented to the indians after the test in 98 uh, this is one aspect uh, that both sides would what stu would not develop ballistic missile defenses but now indians have worked on this and so the question is that is it destabilizing yes of course it's destabilizing how do we 
manage to deal with it. I think, again, this is in the area of conjecture because no one has tried in a real time situation to do this, but the argument is, or at least the estimation is that the radars of the S-400 do not provide 100% cover uh, and there are various gaps in that uh, cover. So uh, if you have uh, the right kind of cruise missiles, which we have tested and uh, we are continuing to develop those tests, uh, then it is possible to hit uh, and penetrate that, uh, that kind of system. Uh, the second is that even if India doubled its number of BMD systems, in our assessment, there are still a lot of Indian targets which will remain vulnerable to a Pakistani nuclear missile attack. Uh, so even they cannot cover the whole landmass of, of, of the Indians. Even the United States can't do that to itself. So there is always a window of vulnerability that will exist that can be exploited. Number three, MERVs. Yes, MERVs because they can carry multiple warheads, the S-400 or any ballistic missile defense system cannot 100% guarantee that it will be able to take out all the incoming ballistic warhead, uh, ballistic, uh, the MERV warheads uh, from the other side. So there is always a, a, as a big question mark and always a large room for for error. So I think that, that is the, the uh, purpose of our own development of uh, developing both uh, cruise missiles um, and MERV missiles, plus uh, our ability to use decoys, chaff. Uh, if, you know, the radars then pick up a lot of signals of incoming projectiles and it's confused it doesn't know whether this is a warhead or whether this is a dud or a dummy so that again is another uh, tactic that can be employed uh, with uh, and we we plan to we are uh, in the process of doing something like this now, the third point of his question if i remember correctly is whether how do we know the whether the warhead on an incoming missile is nuclear or conventional. Uh, again, the short answer is we don't. Uh, and that's what makes it very, very dangerous. Uh, because uh, if there is an incoming missile, if a side launches a missile, and remember what I said in my earlier presentation, that our reaction time is very short it's less than three minutes. So, you know, there is this thing about the saying that the Americans used to use, use them or lose them. So at the point, at the moment you hear, a moment you know that there is a signal, then you launch on warning. And because you don't know whether the warhead carries, that the warhead being carried is, is conventional or nuclear, it makes it much more difficult. I would say the only qualification I would put is that for any country, even for the major powers, to launch a missile with nuclear warheads is a huge big step. And everyone, I think, will be sensible enough to realize uh, that that kind of step needs uh, should not be taken. So we, we should assume that uh, a responsible state uh, even if it launches a ballistic missile, will not be using uh, nuclear warheads. But it enti depends entirely on the situation. Uh, and, and that is something which is a big, a big question mark and we, we really can't say for sure. Sir, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Tara, your question uh, uh, on China, India tensions, and is there a nuclear angle to this? Uh, and I'll request if you can uh, keep your remarks brief because we have more than 
19 questions and yes. comments or the chat section. So we want to give maximum time to the other guests also. Yes, definitely. I'll be very brief, brief and quick. Uh, regarding India-China standoff, I personally believe that there is no nuclear angle, uh, primarily because uh, there is uh, interdependence. Uh, there is so much interdependence on the economic side and the conventional deterrence that uh, exists already between India and China that the nuclear angle does not come largely in picture. I mean, in the hindsight, in the background, of course, the fear exists, but I think it's the conventional deterrence uh, that plays larger role. Uh, and also we must keep in mind the, no matter how flawed or how uh, in, unbelievable their NFU may be, India's NFU may be, but uh, I think that uh, no first use policy between India and China, both having uh, kind of pushes that nuclear angle little more behind. Uh, so in my view, in the current standoff, I don't see any nuclear angle coming into play. Uh, and uh, quickly coming to Saima's question, uh, with regards to safety upgrades follow in following the Fukushima accident. Uh, I think this is very important uh, that uh, Pakistan has uh, to keep in mind that Pakistan has always uh, taken steps with regards to whatever the international practices are. And uh, Pakistan did a comprehensive safety review of all its nuclear facilities in view of the lessons learned from Fukushima and uh, all new requirements, safety requirements issued by the IAEA were incorporated in it, all its uh, facilities existing as well as the new one. And uh, the new facilities, the especially K2 and K3, uh, they had incorporated all passive security measures because this was one of, uh, safety measures, sorry. This was one of the issue that uh, was noted in the Fukushima aspect. So the K2 and K3 do have the passive secure safety measures uh, that would be helpful in mitigating any nuclear safety related issue that might arise in future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. This was a classic case of preemptive response because I didn't put Simon's question to you. <laughs> it was intended to be in the second round. So anyway, thank you. So uh, uh, since we are talking all nuclear, so preemptive response or preemptive strike. Yeah, so, I just saw uh, request, uh, 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 President Cass, yeah. if he wishes to address this uh, question by Mr. Ali Jabir Malik. Uh, on the neglect on the space side and can it weaken Pakistan's nuclear rights? So if you want to address this question. Is yes, I think, the, yes, this question has come up uh, every time that we have had a conference, you know, uh, and every time the answer has been that uh, the space has been neglected, uh, although both the programs started about at the same time, but uh, the nuclear program reached its fruition stage and the space got nowhere. It was because of obviously lack of attention and lack of resources that were devote, devoted to the space program. And now that everything is coming uh, together in the space, that is cyber is getting together, uh, computer technologies, communication is getting together. So uh, electronic warfare is getting together. So now I think there is realization that we need to focus on this, uh, but I guess, in the present circumstances, the problem would be finding the resources, uh, especially after COVID, the economic situation is uh, very bad. But there is no denying that uh, there was not enough focus in the past on our space program. That is why we are lagging behind. Sir, thank you very much for your comments. Okay, the question that I uh, cho chose for myself was about full spectrum deterrence uh, and the credible min minimum deterrence because there were a number of questions and since we have been dealing with these issues for quite a long time, there are several misperceptions about this concept, about the full spectrum deterrence. Uh, full spectrum deterrence, this terminology was coined in 2011 and made public in 2013 for the first time by National Command Authority statement. It was after India introduced its cold start doctrine and India indicated that it can uh, find a possibly uh, find a space for a limited military conflict uh, below Pakistan's perceived nuclear strategic threshold, threshold. So that was the thinking on the Indian side. So what Pakistan did was that while it had strategic capability, it also introduced strategic capability means the medium and long range uh, nuclear capable missiles for deterrence of the major war. It also uh, 
introduce short range ballistic missiles, tactical nuclear weapons, as some people say. So the message was that there is no space for even a limited war between two nuclear powers. So the intent was to cover the entire spectrum of threats ranging from tactical, operational to strategic as Mr. Um, Zamir Akram and myself have pre pre previously stated in our comments. So this was the intent. Many people mistook it as a possible shift from credible minimum deterrence to a full spectrum deterrence. Full spectrum deterrence is within the ambit of credible minimum deterrence. This is not a quantitative shift. This is a qualitative response to the nature of threat that came in Pakistan space and Pakistan was forced to respond. So many people think probably we are building capabilities endlessly and that's where we are going that full spectrum of capabilities or uh, missiles that we are going. It has never been the case. If you see successive NCA statements, we are very categorically stated, we have stated in the past also, the last one also that full spectrum is within the ambit of credible minimum deterrence. Pakistan cannot afford to get into arms race. It has no intent on competing in numbers and in nuclear numbers do not matter. If you are capable of inflicting sufficient or unacceptable damage to the adversary, uh, that's good enough. And that's what the principal purpose of this uh, doctrine of Pakistan nuclear posture has been. So I think we should understand this, uh, um, the concept. It is not a different concept. In the same context, once Balakut strikes happen, many people said the full spectrum meant all conflict. It was never said like this. So that technical kind of operations, those were uh, in, uh, in the form of uh, brigade level or, or uh, integrated battle groups that were part of India's Cold Star Doctrine. So in that case, uh, this full spectrum deterrence was introduced. It was not about there would be a surgical strike and Pakistan would resort to nuclear signaling. No, that was never the case. Surgical strike is entirely a different thing. And Pakistan has always been saying that whenever the crisis will happen or there is a military escalation, there would be conventional responses to whatever India does. And if those conventional responses are not good enough, only then the nuclear capability would come in to give a message that Pakistan will not let it go like this. So Balakot was one example in which India tested Pakistan's resolve by conducting so-called surgical strike and Pakistan responded the way it had planned earlier and uh, we all see the results also. So nobody should assume that whenever there would be a crisis between the full spectrum deterrence uh, posture should kick in, this is entirely a wrong concept. But we can go on to this. Uh, next, I'll go to second round of questions. Uh, first is uh, by our colleague, uh, Director Air Marshal Rishwag. He is asked, how do you view the security of Indian nuclear weapons as well as efficacy of the Indian nuclear command and control under the leadership of war mongering, hardline Hindutva proponents who have demonstrated their irrationality in their decision making in the past few years? So maybe Sitara, you can take this question. <clears throat> Second question, <clears throat> sorry, my apologies. Second question is from Dr. Bilal from Nottingham, United Kingdom. Uh, he says, do the worthy panels and we say it's not to distant future where the advances in directed energy weaponry can erode the deterrence value of existing nuclear delivery mechanisms? If so, then will Pakistan have the luxury of the West looking the other way as they did during the Cold War? So this is second question. Third is about uh, CTBT. There are a number of questions about CTBT. So I'll just add uh, some thoughts to it in the later part, because this recent debate, as Ambassador Akram also said, uh, the debate generated by uh, Washington Post article that United States is probably contemplating testing a nuclear, uh, resuming nuclear test. So which country is most likely to benefit from this resumption of nuclear testing and whether our adversary India, which is building ICBMs, it will test its thermonuclear weapons or not, because without thermonuclear weapons, ICBMs, I think, do not matter much. So Sitara, from, starting from your end, uh, President Kaiser, whenever you want to intervene, uh, you have uh, the floor, sir. Sitara. Uh, yes. Thank you, Dr. Adil. Uh, thank you for the question, Sir Shvak, also. 
uh, India's command and control under Hindutva regime, I think this is something Pakistan and the rest of the world should be very, very worried about and uh, should definitely pay most, att most attention to. Uh, because if we recall not long time ago, Pakistan was uh, under so much international pressure that uh, while I was discussing the nuclear perceived nuclear risks in Pakistan, this was one of the primary risks that international community uh, showed vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan that uh, extremists would take over 70 kilometers away. There are Taliban sitting in Pakistan, but I think those things, none of those things actually materialized, but all those fears are actually happening in India where the leadership itself uh, is not only propagating the extremist ideology, uh, but also threatening. I mean, we must have some confidence in the institutional structure of India, but uh, I think the way they had responded during the Balakot Bulbama crisis, the way they had uh, uh, started signaling nuclear angle from the very initiation of the crisis, this is something really worrisome and not only Pakistan, but the international, it's about time that international community must pay sufficient attention to that aspect. Thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Akram, sir, would you like to uh, deal with this question of CTPT? I know that you have already addressed, but there are a number of questions about CTPT. Will uh, India resume nuclear testing in case United States does and whether it will go for thermonuclear test or not? So let us recall that in 19, May 1998, when the Indians tested, <clears throat> the evaluation of their tests at the international level were not very complimentary. Uh, of the first three tests that were conducted on 11 May, one was about 12 to 15 kilotons, which was uh, successful. Uh, the second apparently fizzled out because no, uh, no seismic uh, uh, soundings were emitted or taken. And the third, which was supposed to be a, uh, a new uh, a, uh, fusion test, you know, in other words, a hydrogen bomb test, uh, apparently, if it was, then it did not go off because apparently the second ex explosion or the secondary ex the secondary explosion, which would have set off the hydrogen uh, bomb, uh, did not happen. So uh, there is a lot of big question mark about uh, whether they were able to test. The other two tests were about, were all, according to the Indians themselves, were sub kiloton tests. Uh, so were they testing a small nuclear warhead or not? Because all they said was that uh, this uh, they it generated data and whatnot, so it was useful for them, their scientists, etc. So keeping that in view, uh, if the CTBT does, uh, it collapses, then uh, India, which is under a unilateral moratorium uh, for not testing, uh, could seriously uh, decide that it wanted to test as well. Uh, we know that in Southern India, there is a nuclear facility which has been working on highly enriched uranium in quantities which I mean, the Indians claim that that is, that is producing HEU for their nuclear uh, powered submarine fleet, but they only have two nuclear powered submarines, one of them doesn't work. So the, the amount of HEU being produced is far in excess of what they what they need for these nuclear powered submarines. So the conclusion uh, that has been drawn by a lot of people, not just by Pakistan, but a number of others, uh, that they are actually producing high quantities of HEU for a thermonuclear bomb. And if they are actually trying to develop a thermonuclear bomb, they may well test. Then uh, I would also refer people to read uh, one or two articles written by George Perkovich, who has been an authority on the Indian program, who wrote uh, after the, the NSG waiver that was given that one of the things that India would do is that it would uh, accumulate sufficiently high quantities of 
fissile material through imports from abroad and build up a critical stockpile following which it would conduct its own tests and if they were uh, as a result of that expelled or, or challenged uh, by the international community, they would basically withdraw their unilateral commitment to the CTBT. So if this happens, yes, I think the Indians will test. And um, if I were a Pakistani scientist, I would want to test too. Uh, definitely, I mean, a scientist for the, for the science, nuclear scientists, definitely more data is always more essential. So yeah, this is, I think this is how the situation is. But the, the bottom line, I think at the moment, it all depends on what the US does. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, just uh, my apologies. I also posed this question, uh, shared this question by Dr. Bilal Shah from Nottingham, UK. This was about oh, directed, directed energy. energy. Yeah. So, directed, okay. So, I mean, we are now at a point uh, where there are uh, a, a, the technological developments that are taking place are creating a totally new uh, environment in which strategic stability and deterrence would have to be uh, established or, or ensured. Directed energy weapons, lasers, whatever, are one of those kind of things uh, that are under development. Artificial intelligence is now clearly uh, a, a part of the uh, strategic uh, arsenal of the major powers. And then there is uh, cyber cyber warfare uh, and cyber warfare is such that uh, because we are all now increasingly online and in fact all our systems are uh, controlled or in some way involved computers and electronics in the in the system uh, a kind of virus that is introduced into the system by your opponent uh, and you may not, and one may not even detect it. And, and we know that the Americans have tried to do this with the Iranian program, the Stuxnet virus that was introduced. And they've also tried to do this with the North Korean missile tests, uh, which they claim uh, set back the North Korean missile program for a long time. So this technology has been used. Unfortunately, the strategic communities whether in the US or in Russia or China or Pakistan or India, uh, have not yet been able to come up with how we are going to respond. Uh, I think the first step for us uh, in Pakistan is to insulate our systems by, uh, for instance, insulating our communication systems, command and control systems, et cetera. And I know that we have done that uh, in, in many ways uh, by changing the SOPs for communications, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the threat is multiple, as I just mentioned, the different ways this can happen. Uh, and we need to find ways of how to deal with it. Uh, the thing that comes into my mind is basically go low tech instead of going high tech. If you go low tech, you know, when I was in the foreign office, uh, when we had to send an ultra extremely sensitive secret communication, uh, we sent it written by hand and delivered by hand. We didn't trust any kind of electronic, even in those days. So I think that answer would be to go low tech as far as we can uh, and prevent these kind of, uh, but that's not a, solution for the long term, we have to come up with uh, the other is, of course, developing countervailing capability. And that's obvious, because if your opponent has the capability, and we don't have the capability, there will be a uh, tendency to take the risk by the opponent to use the capability, just as, as I was mentioning in space, uh, as long as we don't test our own anti-satellite capability, the Indians have us at a disadvantage because they can knock out our communication satellites anytime they want. And that, with that, we are blind. 
And so we, unless we have a deterrent to knock out the Indians, uh, then we would have deterrent. So this is a game of cat and mouse that will continue to go on. Sir, thank you very much. Uh, there was another part to this uh, question on full spectrum deterrence that I forgot to address because uh, there's also a perception that full spectrum deterrence means by announcing that we have uh, short range and strategic uh, range weapons. So Pakistan probably is thinking for a kind of escalation letter which some people would say graduated response. I haven't read any literature and I haven't heard any statement where Pakistan would say this thing that we would start from the minimum and go to the maximum. It was never the case. The full spectrum was that in case there is a threat of a major war, the strategic weapons are there. But if your adversary is coming with kind of integrated battle groups uh, as part of its gold star doctrine, we have a response for that also. So that's my understanding. And again, a question about quid pro quo plus. In simple terms, this terminology in the, uh, I think, decision-making circles was uh, prevalent. Uh, but for the first time recently, uh, General Kidwai uh, uh, used this term terminology as quid pro quo plus. In simple terms, uh, Pakistan's response will be with a premium. So that's the message to India. Whatever India will do, Pakistan's conventional response will come with a premium. So that's a quid pro quo plus, I think. So we move on to another round where uh, uh, Mr. Aziz has asked about the prospects of intermediate nuclear force treaty. Uh, it's uh, related to major powers rivalry and we all know that uh, United States want China to be integrated into this kind of a trilateral arms control competition. But Ambassador Akram, as you know, there was some people thinking about uh, bringing in or roping in India and Pakistan also into the INF Treaty, whereas INF only bans 500 to certain uh, range of uh, 5,500 kilometers of uh, missiles. Uh, this was a debate generated. And of course, it doesn't suit our interests because all our missiles of this, this range and if you were ever to be part of the INF, so it means you're giving up all your missile inventory. But since this question has been asked by a participant, so I'll request you to respond. And the second, uh, Ms. Sitara, we have talked about NSG. Uh, the question by Ms. Anika is, are there prospects for India to get into the NSG? Ambassador, I come first you, sir. Okay, so um, I think the, the argument that is being made by the Trump administration that the INF treaty must also include first and foremost China, because uh, uh, a lot of the Chinese missile inventory is, falls within that range. Uh, and then some have even talked about India and Pakistan. I think this is a false and uh, you know, it, it's a false uh, argument meant to, to distract and divert attention from the real issue, which is that the Americans are not comfortable with the INF treaty and that they want to develop their own uh, and they want to walk out of it, develop their own capabilities. And because they've also been accusing the Russians of violating this treaty. So I think that's the real purpose. Uh, I also think that the Americans know as well as anyone else that the Chinese are not going to agree to become a part of any uh, trilateral arrangement uh, on INF, uh, let alone India and Pakistan. Uh, because as you said, the, for India and Pakistan, that's the, the, the real, that is the, the real nature of our, our, our missile capabilities. And we are not about to, uh, to hand them out uh, for the sake of this INF treaty between the US and Russia. So I think that the, the possibility of any of this kind of happening outside the bilateral US-Russian equation uh, is not possible at all. Ms. Sitara on the NSC question, please. Yes, on the NSC. Uh, apart from Anika's question on uh, India's prospects of making it to NSG, there is a related question from 
Ms. Adila as well, how many countries supporting India and Pakistan for that matter. Uh, I think situation at the NSG is evolving as uh, since the date stuff, uh, since the debate started. Uh, and I think it is, it is at this kind of stalemate now where I think Pakistan's primary support comes from China as well as from Turkey. Uh, who are supporting Pakistan's stance of uh, having a criteria-based approach. Some countries uh, in privately have also supported Pakistan's stance, but uh, what actually matters is how many show up for the voting. Uh, so as long as Pakistan retains its support from China as well as from Turkey, uh, or at least one country's support, I think India's prospect of joining, becoming a member would be limited to none. Uh, and uh, Pakistan should continue to work for uh, the development of a criteria-based approach where country not only on the political uh, conditions, but on a criteria where they meet certain requirements uh, of a nuclear supplies group, uh, a certain criteria should be established for the non-NPT member states, which can actually enable them to become part. So, so yeah, I mean, of course, developments can take place in future, but Pakistan and India in the back end are continuously working for their own uh, benefit. That, that's that's I would want to add. Thank you very much. I'll just add on to the NSE debate since uh, I was personally involved once I was working in the government. I no longer work in the government, so I don't speak on behalf of any government institution at the moment. Uh, but on the NSC, we have to take into consideration that nuclear supplies growth is an informal arrangement. It's a not a legal regime or legal treaty. So why India is so much interested in getting into the NSG once it has already been granted an exemption from the Nuclear Supplies Group Export Control Guidelines in 2008 by the NSG group. And India can trade and uh, get into nuclear trade with all the NSG members. So the primary purpose of India is this diplomatic push and they invested so much that uh, all the successive uh, US administrations, they were, uh, kind of pleading India's case that India should be brought into the NSG uh, because India is so-called a responsible country. So this is irony, this is all politics. As we also discussed earlier also, the NSG came into existence after India's misuse of peaceful nuclear technology for weapons purposes, and then the London Group came in and the NSG was created to prevent future such action. And after so many years, now the same group was uh, in a way trying to bring India inside it. So it is not only China or Turkey which were opposed to India. There are several European countries who joined NSC based on the principles, on non-proliferation principles, that we need to stop this proliferation of nuclear technology or, or misuse of civilian technology for peaceful purposes. So there are a number of countries. Once we launched this uh, initiative and we reached out to uh, countries, especially the European countries who are part of the NSE, they feel cheated because they say that we signed the NPT and we adhere to all non-proliferation norms and we were told not to build weapons and still even the peaceful nuclear technology is regulated, some are denied on political reason, whereas this is a country which misuse civil technology for military purpose. And for this country, we made this arrangement and now you, are, you have granted this country an exemption also. And now you want to bring it into the NSG because NSG works on a consensus. So once India would be part of the NSG, so it will have a veto power on all the decision-making that goes on with the NSG. So this is the irony. Uh, People talk about the, mainly the United States. They built an argument that India is a big country, big market, big nuclear market, so we need to bring India inside. It will help non-proliferation credentials. Pakistan's position had been, okay, if it helps a non-NPT state, if it helps to bring a non-NPT state into the NSG, why not to bring all the non-NPT states into the NSG? So make a criteria which is non-discriminatory and it helps the global non-proliferation norms also and it will help universalize the non-proliferation regime also, which interestingly was the title of my first book that I wrote once I was at King's College, Universalizing Nuclear Non-Proliferation Norms. And here I, in that book, I have discussed this idea how non-NPT states can be integrated into mainstream non-proliferation regime, but the criteria has to be objective based on principle, not discriminatory criteria. 
Now, uh, last round of uh, questions. I think uh, we should move on to. There's a question by uh, our young researchers. Let me give them an opportunity also um, because they take lots of interest. By Omar Ahmed, how can Pakistan and China collaborate to counter India's manipulation of higher politics or in international domain? When, uh, so that's a basic question. And from Mahin, can you please elaborate on influence of China in South Asian nuclear dynamics, given that India is rapidly advancing its nuclear capabilities with the US help? Will that US India succeed in exerting global diplomatic pressure on China as this is what Indian military is suggesting as a solution? Also keeping US China rivalry during the prior to the virus in view. And Mr. Tara, can you take this second question? And I'll request Ambassador Samir Akram to take Omar Amir's question. And then I'll briefly talk about, uh, again, there was a question by Shaza Arif about no first use, and then we will close and I'll request President Kass to make his concluding remarks there. Ms. Sitara. Uh, sir, can you please go first? I was actually reading the question and I just... Okay. So this is a question by Ms. Mahin Shafiq. Yeah. Uh, can you please elaborate on influence of China in South Asian nuclear dynamics, given that India is rapidly advancing its nuclear capabilities with the U.S. help? Will the U.S.-India succeed in exerting global diplomatic pressure on China, as this is what India... It's about new Cold War emerging. So there have been strong statements by China also advising India not to get involved between two big brothers. So that's the question probably you, if you want to address because you just recently wrote on this issue. Yes. I, I, I just actually lost track of the question. I was reading Mahin's question. I'm Maybe sorry. Ambassador Samira comes yes, uh, please, can, can you please go uh, ahead first? Take I'll, I'll just take about I just lost the text of the question, sorry. Pakistan, China, can they collaborate to uh, neutralize India? Or if there is a need for uh, China and Pakistan to collaborate to neutralize India's growing influence or interventions in regional politics? Are you asking me? Sir, sir. Okay, so I think that yes, Pakistan and China uh, are already uh, close partners and uh, especially after the growing competition between the United States and China, this uh, Pakistan-China relationship has become, uh, has assumed even greater importance. Let us step back a bit and say, and, and recall that around about 2008-2009, when China emerged as the second largest world economy replacing Japan, and in some ways it overtook even the United States in some sectors, even the United, uh, United States, especially in technology and other, uh, other areas, the US has been, and while at the same time, the US was embroiled in two major wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, which have been a great drain on their economy, apart from the economic collapse that took place in, uh, in 2008. So since that time, the US has tried to pursue uh, a policy whereby they are, where they want to contain China. And they want to contain it through alliances with existing strategic partners or new strategic partners. These include Japan, Australia, and new partners such as India, Vietnam. And now we have this thing called the quadrilateral alliance, which includes the US, India, Australia, and Japan, which is a alliance which ostensibly is meant to keep the freedom of navigation, uh, to ensure freedom of navigation in the so-called Indo-Pacific region. And uh, real, in reality, it is meant to contain China and to contest its claims or its what China sees as its uh, rightful uh, so sovereignty over places such as the South China Sea or the East China Sea, as well as now as we are seeing it unfold in these in the borders with India, uh, particularly in Ladakh. So, in this environment, the Chinese responded by 
coming up with their belt and road initiative which is a strategic objective to create a backup or a fall back option whereby if their sea lanes are choked if they are denied sea access by this quadrilateral alliance then china will at least have a fall back land route to the rest of the world starting with uh, pakistan where cpac is a, is is the sort of flagship project now you know that cpac has been opposed by india and as by the united states the united states has also launched a major offensive saying that china's loans cpac loans to pakistan are unfair they are draining pakistan's resources etc and they've started a propaganda war uh, against pakistan and the, the, against the pakistan china relationship the indians have gone one step further i blame them i i believe that indians are responsible for terrorist attacks uh, that involved the chinese against the chinese such as the attack on the chinese consulate in karachi and on other parts of balochistan uh which is meant to uh, derail the cpac project then they have come up with this accusation that pakistan has provided a naval base to china and gwadar and elsewhere and that this there is this string of pearls which there isn't but the string of pearl strategy that china has tried to pursue it's in this kind of geopolitical environment that pakistan and china are required to respond to this growing animosity by the united states and its strategic partner india whereas the, so far both pakistan and china have been proposing a dialogue to india seeking a better relationship with with the united states but our offers and those offers of the chinese have been uh, have been rejected leading finally to this stuff stance that the chinese of have taken uh, vis-a-vis india and vis-a-vis the united states as well and so this kind of new cold war that is has come into being uh, is definitely going to affect uh, our region definitely going to affect our relationship uh, with with the major powers and and we we should decide which side we are going to be on i'm sure i know that a lot of people in pakistan are still trying to argue that we should have you know uh our partnership with the united states there is no partnership because there is no strategic convergence they just need our help to get them a face saving exit from afghanistan that's it and we should realize that that's the extent of their interest in pakistan as of now so thank you very much i think very comprehensively covered uh, ms satara uh, your question was also in the same context but if you want to add something go ahead please. yes sir. very yes, briefly sir. yeah thank you very much uh, to my hands question i think uh, as the ambassador saab has already very uh, clearly defined that china's role had been prominent and uh, china and pakistan had i mean if we even if we look at china's approach largely had been more of a cooperative nature vis-a-vis mm-hmm. -vis US as well as India but now the how the situation is developing i think it's uh, more than anyone it's India and the US are to be blamed if china becomes confrontational because uh, they were being pushed in that corner so if china's response towards and if it's specific blog about pakistan's uh, china's help towards pakistan that has always been there and over the time that would only increase and uh, any external pressure would not Uh, actually affect that and if we i think we also need to focus on how chinese policies are evolving uh how chinese pattern vis-a-vis -vis cpac are, uh, are evolving as well apparently cpac's focus is shifting even in pakistan from infrastructural development to digital silk road initiative which according to some analysts that uh, have uh, have pointed out that uh, which has a stronger military dimension and perhaps that is why cpac's uh, cpac is receiving more a uh, visible and repeated american criticism uh, lately despite a perceived slowdown in the otherwise infrastructural cpac related projects so i think pakistan china collaboration would only increase uh, and uh, if we also take into account that uh, more intelligence sharing 
uh, agreement have taken place between China and Pakistan? And if also I take back to uh, Chinese response during C uh, Pulbama Balakur crisis, uh, there is a growing perception in the United States that uh, China, who previously used to be uh, on the US side, when it comes to India, China, uh, diffusing India, China, uh, India, Pakistan confrontation, China had always been with the United States in helping diffusing the tension or taking or letting United States take the leading role. But Chinese role, according to many perceptions, uh, the perceived role had been, uh, according to many American uh, officials, had been more uh, advertently or inadvertently more provocative. Uh, or not really helpful, if I put it that way. So China definitely is taking larger role in India-Pakistan equation, as well as not only by helping Pakistan more in the uh, strategic level, but also by changing nature, somewhat changing nature of the CPAC that uh, has probably raised greater concerns in the US as well as in India. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just uh, uh, to re-emphasize the last statement, China, is helping Pakistan at the strategic level. I'm sure that uh, many would uh, take it in a different direction since this uh, webinar was about nuclear. On nuclear side, we are, what we do, we do, do it uh, on our own because we know the kind of threat and we don't rely on any other country for on strategic capability. And that's our history has been. And thank thank you for to, clarifying that. Yeah, that, that's yeah. not what I meant, yeah. yeah. Uh, about no first use, uh, there are two questions by Ms. Shiza Arif and Mr. Imran Rahman. Uh, let me just briefly talk about that no first use. First of all, it's not a legally binding commitment. States declare their nuclear policies to convey their intent. And of course, most states follow those intent because unless you have a doctrine, you don't uh, lay out your development plans and things like that. But in India's case, uh, as Shaza, you asked that will India uh, review its no first use posture? I don't think so. It will officially review its posture, but it has created sufficient ambiguity in its stated position on no first use that its adversaries, Pakistan and possibly including China, they will have to take into consideration that in future there is a possibility that India might resort to a first strike of a preemptive strike because we never trusted their no first use. But after the statements of senior members of India's National Command Authority or the Nuclear Command Authority, as they say, uh, there is sufficient ambiguity. And in terms of preparedness, I think when there is a doubt, there is always value or premium in taking precautionary measures. And that's what probably Pakistan will have to take into consideration that India can get into this mischief or could be encouraged by their, especially the scientists, community, the DRDO and the military, that we can possibly contemplate this thing, which would be a very, very dangerous thing. And uh, uh, as I al already said, the response from Pakistan would be with premium and uh, it will be more than what India would expect. With this, uh, we will close this question answer session and I'll request President Kass and Chief Marshal Kaleem Sadat to give his concluding thoughts, observations or make comments. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much. First of all, I must congratulate all the three speakers. They very ably answered all the questions that were put to them right at the beginning. Uh, and they also comprehensively addressed the questions that were posed in the Q&A session. It is not possible for me to summarize what has been said in two hours in five minutes. However, there are some important uh, points made. I will only refer touch upon those. Uh, Ambassador Zamir Akram, uh, in his uh, basic remarks said that, uh, you know, the FSD, cannot prevent skirmishes. This we must understand. You know, people think that if Balakot or Uri kind of incident take place, Pakistan should quickly load up its missiles and be ready. You know, that's not the intent. He also emphasized that the nuclear threshold is based on a certain criteria, you know, and that criteria has been determined or will be determined, in fact, because it's an evolving situation uh, after carefully deliberating over the pros and cons. So there is no automatic, uh, you know, nuclear threshold. 
then he also emphasized very rightly the uh, conventional capabilities that India is adding uh, by the ballistic missile defense, etc., and you know the hypersonic weapons and so on, etc. So it's an ongoing. Uh, like I said, perhaps in my opening remarks, that since partition, this arms race has been going in, uh, going on. Uh, India creates a capability, Pakistan tries to catch up and it catches up, then India adds to that capability and goes on and on. So uh, on the, the other point that he made very uh, rightly was that uh, Indo-Pak engagement in the present uh, situation is out of the question because India refuses to talk. And I personally think that Pakistan should not be begging uh, India for talks, etc. If it doesn't want to engage, so be it. We can ignore them. We continue with what we think is in our best interest and we will ensure our security. And uh, uh, the lessons from the Cold War very rightly again pointed out that, you know, the arms race ultimately becomes wasteful. It provides you security during the transition period, but when the technologies move on, you found, find that that uh, expenditure is not wasteful in the past. But that's how it has been and that is how it will uh, remain. Uh, and another in the Q&A, a very important point made by him, and I think we all should understand this, that Pakistan is ambivalent in which direction it must take. You see, you can't be indecisive. When you come against a white folk, you have to decide whether you want to go right or you want to go left. So uh, as he said that uh, there is uh, no convergence of interest with America. It is transactional. It has always been transactional. Whenever America needed us, they came close to us. And when that need was fulfilled, it went away. While China has stood by us all along uh, throughout our history in good and in bad and in difficult situations, it has always supported us. So I just don't understand the reason for the ambiguity that we uh, have with us. Uh, coming to Dr. Adil's this thing, I think he made a very good point about what has motivated the development of nuclear capability on either side. For India, it has always been a great power status uh, and its competition with China and prestige. Pakistan has just been able, just been trying to be secure, to save itself from you know the machinations that India has always been doing. And. Uh, uh, one thing I want to, uh, in the conventional domain, I would want to highlight that, you know, the small little actions that India takes, it, it takes for the consumption of the media, you know, because it's a small incident, whether it is Uri, whether it is Balakot, but the media runs away with it, you know, and take the example of this pigeon story. I mean, it is so ridiculous that uh, they were discussing, the channels were discussing this story with so much of enthusiasm as if Pearl Harbor has been attacked. You know, they were so excited about it. So we have to be mindful that whatever next war or operations that take place will take place under the eye of the media. So when we determine our targeting, we have to keep in mind that what impact will it have on the media warfare or the information warfare that takes place subsequent to that small action that we take over there. Uh, so uh, then uh, I come to uh, Ms. Tara's presentation. Again, uh, she focused on a very uh, important aspect of Pakistan's development, that is the peaceful nuclear development. And she outlined various activities that have gone on, which have helped uh, in fields of medicine, health, uh, agriculture, etc., which we usually don't take into account because whenever we talk about nuclear, we do want to talk about nuclear weapons. But these achievements are uh, important in their own right, and they need to be improved further. And uh, upgradation, et cetera, has to take place. Uh, in the Q&A, there were these answers about the S-400. And again, Ambassador Zamir Akram highlighted that uh, S-400 is not a magic weapon, that you know it will protect you against everything. We know that science uh, limits things, you know? Uh, there are low-level radars, there are medium-level radars, there are high-level radars, and there are other kinds of radars. And then when the Americans brought in uh, stealth, you, these radars were useful, uh, useless. 
So you had to develop another kind of radars to detect uh, stealth aeroplanes, etc. So uh, again, this is the march of technology. You uh, find a weapon and you then find an antidote. And so uh, S-400 will have gaps. Uh, it is also applicable to the field of artificial intelligence. We again think that artificial intelligence is magic. No, artificial intelligence can only do one specific thing for a particular reason, for the particular need. So one artificial intelligence software will not look after all your needs. For every activity, for every domain, you have to develop a new algorithm and that can be done. So there is no magic bullet, even in artificial intelligence to do this. The human mind is versatile. It can at a time take on many uh, activities simultaneously, but the artificial it is not. Uh, again, uh, there was this uh, question of uh, uh, no first use. Actually, uh, the strong, uh, powerful countries don't need the uh, NFU. Uh, it is only the uh, weak states, you know, relatively less powerful people that have to defend themselves that go over there. And anyway, like Dr. Adil pointed out, it is a notion, you know, you don't have to adhere to it. The, the nuclear weapons or any weapons for that matter are supposed to serve uh, your security interests. They are supposed to protect you and they will uh, be used whenever their use is required to be optimum. So uh, I personally don't uh, buy too much into Indian NFU. Uh, it can be in uh, discussions, etc. but ultimately I think everybody will use the weapons when they are required. So having said, uh, these things uh, have I left a point important one or two? No. Now I'll just go over the uh, a few points that I had written for myself. Uh, one thing that we understand from today's discussion is that it is obvious that life for Pakistan would have been even more difficult if Pakistan had not done what it did on uh, 28 May 1998. That's we are very clear. The world powers were discriminatory then, and they are discriminatory now. India has a waiver from NSG following the Indo-American nuclear deal, while Pakistan does not. The world's criticism of India's atrocities in Kashmir is muted due to economic and other considerations. As already pointed out by Ambassador uh, Zamir Akram, the march towards arms control has been halted as treaties are being abandoned and there is a deliberate effort to militarize, nuclearize, and colonize the space. USA has created a space force with the intent to mine the moon and other celestial bodies. The idea of a space as a common is being abandoned. The global security situation as a whole is becoming more and more volatile and unpredictable. We are in a situation where the nuclear armed countries have this overarching fear of the other. The Booking Institute released a study in 2017 titled The Strategic Chain, which was also referred to by Ambassador Zamir Akram. The purpose was to highlight that the nuclear linkage between the United States, China, India, and Pakistan. It is interesting to see that every country perceives itself to be the victim of mischief of a would-be aggressor. The result is an arms race you know, which has now reached outer space. Uh, what I find strange is and, uh, that all apparently want to live in peace, but would not let others do the same. You know, this is the dichotomy that uh, exists forever. So it all proves the point that Little Hard made a long time ago. He said, and I quote, to abolish war, we must remove its cause, which lies in the imperfection of human nature, unquote. So the likes of Mr. Trump, Modi, and Netanyahu must wage wars and come out victorious. This is that imperfect human nature that is behind all this chaos that exists in the world. In my judgment, the world finds itself in the most unstable position since the Second World War because powerful countries are abandoning the rule-based order that they had created following that long destructive war. Whether it is a storm created by Mr. Trump's America First policy or it is here to stay for a longer time, we would only know from the result of the 2020 US elections in November. Mr. 
Trump's support for Mr. Modi has destabilized the South Asian region by becoming, by Mr. Modi becoming ambitious and aggressive. The new great game is giving rise to new political strategic alignment, which have been alluded to by the speakers today. The attempt is to disrupt the Chinese rise through the outreach in the South China Sea and one belt, one road initiative. So this is both a challenge and opportunity for us. My fear is that we don't grab opportunities with a great deal of alacrity. We are busy with our own political infighting and don't have time for strategic initiatives. India is wanting to undo the CPAC project. I don't know what we are doing about it. There is a frenetic activity seen on the part of our adversaries, but the same kind of urgency is not evident on our side. The information warfare has to pick up speed. In Indian sponsored webinars, they convey an impression that Pakistan and China have some very sinister plans up their sleeves. Whereas the reality is that these two countries are just trying to deal with the Indian shenanigans of February and August 2019. India needs to understand finally that others can be pushed to the wall and when there is no room for retreat, the pushed will resist with everything at their disposal. In the end, once again, I thank all the three speakers and all other participants for their patience and active participation in this webinar. Thank you very much. Sir, thank you for this, uh, I think, comprehensive remarks. Uh, we now close the session and my sincere apologies to all the participants uh, who asked the questions, but, but we couldn't include those questions in our discussion session. Uh, I hope you will uh, 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 bear with this because we had to uh, limit this session for, it has already gone more than two hours. Thank you very much and uh, stay safe. For the office. For the office.